So as I said, my name is Gabrielle. I am the Community Partnerships and Adult Programs Manager for the Buffalo Museum of Science. This is the first of our online versions of the Conversations in Science. Originally, these programs were held at the museum with organic conversations really throughout the presentation and at the end, but we're very pleased to bring the virtual format to you today. We thank especially RP Oak Hill a building company for their continued support and presenting sponsorship for conversations in science. It's the support of our sponsors, donors, and members that enable us to continue our mission and to serve the community. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Steve McMartin of Medai College. Dr. McMartin is a clinical assistant professor and director of the Medai College bachelor and master's degree programs in Homeland Security. Professor McMartin retired in July of 2011 as a senior special agent national program manager with the United States Department of Homeland Security after a 31 year career. Professor McMartin has a wide range of experience from arresting terrorists for working on a UN sanctions assistance monitor. And for two months immediately following 9-11, Professor McMartin participated in the World Trade Center recovery effort. He is a former certified computer forensic examiner, a former firearms instructor, and a former tactical team member. Professor McMartin received a bachelor's of science degree in physical education from St. Lawrence University a master's degree in organizational leadership from Madai College, and a doctorate in business administration and global leadership from California Intercontinental University. Dr. McMartin, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'll turn it over to you with the reminder that everyone can direct their questions to me in the chat or raise your hand in order to be recognized and unmuted. So with that, we will begin. Okay. Thank you, Gabrielle. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Buffalo Museum of Science for asking me to do this. Uh, um, I like to teach, but I really enjoy getting together in groups like this. People have a specific or a special interest in a topic, um, something that we can uh, discuss. So uh, this is, this is uh, fun for me, uh, and I enjoy it. Um, as Gabrielle said, I, I want to make this a discussion forum. As we go along, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, Gabrielle will bring it to my notice in case I don't. I've got a, a bunch of things going on on the screen here to keep track of. Um, but if you have a question, uh, it's the same in my classes. If you have a question, the person sitting next to you probably has the same question. So you should feel free to uh, go ahead and chime in anytime. This is a discussion. So you uh, heard about me. Um, I'm not going to go through this again. Um, some of these PowerPoint slides are, are uh, a skeleton of the presentation for me to help me uh, get along. But this is the same type of information you got from Gabrielle a little earlier. Um, I just will say uh, a little bit about me uh, in case you're confused or you don't understand. Um, working in Homeland Security, uh, I worked on many, 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 many issues that involved emergency preparedness and disaster response. Um, I worked uh, on Olympic Games. I worked on the World University Games. If you remember, they were held here in, in 1993. Uh, all participating in the protection and, and, and the um, uh, readiness to respond to, to really anything that, that would have happened. Um, but you have to remember that somebody in a federal position like mine I'm not a first responder. If there's an actual emergency, the local police, the local EMTs, um, uh, those are the folks that are actually responding on the ground. Now, I'm, I'm a secondary or tertiary responder in that, um, uh, for example, uh, at the World Trade Center, uh, when I went down, I, I was very intensely involved in that response, but I wasn't there the day after. Um, so just so you understand um, the, the difference. Um, disaster preparedness and emergency response. Gabrielle asked me to do the presentation, and the first thing that went through my mind is, well, exactly what am I going to cover? Um, and just for example, 
in the 14 bachelor's courses we have at Madai in Homeland Security, three cover this topic, three full semester long courses. In the master's degree, uh, one of the 10 courses uh, does a full semester long course. So this is a very intensely, a uh, very in-depth subject. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about risk assessment later on uh, in my doctoral courses, there were 15 courses, an entire uh, single one of those courses was dedicated to risk management. So it's a complicated subject. Um, I'm only gonna hit the high points. Uh, we're gonna talk about small businesses and individuals because that's really where uh, the general information is gonna be most helpful. Um, uh, so I guess just keep that in mind that we're not, we're not getting into the weeds with this. We're just covering uh, very briefly and topically uh, some of these subjects. So uh, the first thing we do, uh, uh, I do when I talk about any, anything in, in an interview like this or in a class is we have to lay down the definitions. We have to all understand what we're, we're talking about. So what is a disaster? I, I think everybody can understand what a disaster is. Um, and I've, I've got a list here of a few things, a wildfire, a hurricane, earthquake, flood, blizzard, tornado, chemical spill, terrorist. You can read all of these. And I've highlighted, of course, a virus. The virus, the COVID-19 virus has created a disaster uh, and required an emergency management and response from governments at, at all levels. And so that is included in here. Um, and what you have to look at from that list as you, as you look at those things is there's really two types of disasters. There's man-made disasters caused, you know, uh, a terrorist attack or a chemical spill. And there's natural disasters, wildfires, hurricanes, blizzards. Um, when considering disaster preparedness, you have to consider all of these. And, and um, as I'll get to in our slide, you have to, when you're considering that you're very possibly going to be faced with those, you're not only assessing the risk of, of possibly facing them, but you have to consider the worst case scenario. It's no good saying, well, if we have a flood, it might just be a little one. Um, so too many times uh, uh, when people think about a disaster and, and research has shown this, uh, and especially in, in, in uh, emergency situations, uh, right at the first moment of a car accident or uh, the, the first moment that you've dropped something it's about to shatter on on the floor people say this can't be happening or it can't happen here and i want to emphasize that you need to go back and look at my list two two uh, buttons ago <clears throat> excuse me where i said disaster could be a wildfire a hurricane an earthquake a flood a blizzard a tornado etc and then look at where i've listed the second list Everything in green is something that has happened in Western New York. It's a disaster that has occurred here. You can't say it won't happen here because ha, it can happen here. Uh, I've highlighted in red terrorist attack. Uh, and although we've had no terrorist attacks uh, per se in uh, Western New York, there have been a number, some that you know of, some that you don't, that have been prevented. Um, uh, and we were, you know, a, a whisker. Uh, with away from actually having uh, such an attack. So that could have been ap uh, added to the list. So um, it's just uh, something you need to consider that um, disaster ha, won't happen here, can't happen to me, well it can. And, and you know, I think if you live long enough and you're in enough places, uh, it will. Um, one disaster I haven't mentioned in that list, um, and again, I won't go back to that list, but you'll remember what I just had, had um, dotted down, is uh, a da disaster that can occur because of cybercrime. And again, this is something that's, oh, it can't happen here, it won't affect me. Well, it can. Um, now, the biggest example that you can remember was back in 2017, or you should remember, when Erie County Medical Center's computers were taken over and uh, they were actually held for uh, a digital ransom to get their equipment back. Um, and uh, um, what eventually happened was, I believe, they, they decided not to pay the ransom, however much it was, and uh, decided to redo their entire uh, digital and computer infrastructure. And it ended up costing them, uh, and it's a well-publicized number, $10 million to recover from that uh, ransom attack. 
Um, as you see, the IBM chairman said cybercrime is the greatest threat to every company in the world. Uh, well, I was a cybercrime investigator for 15 years, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to wait till we get to a, an, an additional slide, but when we say, you know, it can't happen here, I'm going to tell you about a, um, a very popular uh, organization, a business organization in Western New York, where it just happened to them, and, and they're facing um, the, the recovery, and, and uh, they weren't prepared. A lot of things we're going to talk about tonight, some of the examples I'm going to use are organizations uh, or, or instances of families and homeowners that were not prepared. And uh, it's a scary thing that, that this thing, that something like this can happen to you and you're not prepared. Uh, you see my statistic there, according to FEMA, more than 40% of businesses never reopen after a disaster. And you can see now just with COVID-19, just with a, a singular but worldwide and large disaster, the number of businesses, uh, all you need to do is drive around Western New York that have closed. Uh, because of this. I'm sure probably all of you are, are personally familiar with one or more businesses that have closed down. Um, we will talk about this a little bit. We'll talk about COVID. Um, there are ways that people could have been prepared for this. Um, you might not have seen the, the virus coming, but again, in planning, uh, proper planning for uh, the worst case scenario, it's something businesses or, and organizations could have uh, uh, prepared for. Uh, the one example I like to use a success story here is uh, Morgan Stanley. You'll see if you remember back in 1993, uh, that was the first World Trade Center bombing, if anybody remembers. Um, some uh, terrorists blew up a uh, vehicle bomb in the underground parking garage of the World Trade Center. Didn't cause nearly the damage um, that 9-11 um, uh, did, um, but it was still a huge bombing. Um, and during the evacuation, this particular company, Morgan Stanley, who's, who's done an after-action report on this, said it took them four hours to evacuate their 2,700 employees from the World Trade Center. Um, well, we all know now that in four hours, both towers were down uh, after 9-11. So four hours was, was a long time. Um, in the intervening years, however, before 9-11, the company developed a, an emergency plan and uh, one of the points I like to, to make here is uh, in this report, if, if you pull up the, the article on Morgan Stanley's uh, response, um, they practiced it. And no plan is worth the paper it's written on unless it's implemented through practice. Uh, it's much like a fire drill. Everybody has fire drills. We had fire drills when I was a kid in school. We've, I've had fire drills every organization I've ever worked for, every school I've ever gone to. Uh, and I'm sure I would think most of the organizations you folks work for have fire drills. Um, I have done some uh, active shooter drills and some active shooter classes. And one of the things I stress uh, with organizations of any size or educational institutions, it doesn't matter, um, is that you, you should one, have an, a plan to address an active shooter and what you will do. You need to share that plan with everyone that could be affected and you need to practice it just like a fire drill. Well, a disaster preparedness drill is, is the same thing. Morgan Stanley prepared this plan and they practiced it. And as a result, following the uh, World Trade Center attack in 9-11, they were right uh, below one of the floors that was initially hit by the aircraft. And it took them only 45 minutes um, to uh, evacuate their offices. Um, 45 minutes was almost <laughs> too long, uh, but certainly, um, um, having the plan, having identified the worst case scenario, implementing the plan among every employee and then practicing it brought them down to where they lost. Uh, they did lose seven employees. Uh, I believe most of them in the initial hit. I don't believe after they started evacuation, they lost anybody. So um, uh, practice makes perfect. Um, that kind of addresses, uh, if, you're, if you're here viewing this because you're a small business, well, why my business? Um, I, I can't stress enough that disaster can strike anyone. Uh, and, and in COVID, uh, the, the good example here is all of the small businesses that have gone uh, out, of, out of business that might have been able to hang on had they had a disaster plan in place. So then the next question you wanna ask is, is why me? So I, ha I have a little anecdote here. I grew up in a town called Ogdensburg, New York. And uh, 
people from, from New York City call this, Western New York, Syracuse, they call that upstate. Anything, anything above the five counties of New York to someone uh, in New York City is upstate. Well, Ogdensburg is really upstate. It's uh, near Canton and Potsdam and Watertown, uh, near, in, somewhat near Plattsburgh, Messina. It's on the St. Lawrence River. It's a four-hour trip from Buffalo, an eight-hour trip from New York. Augsburg is really upstate. So when I moved here, uh, the first thing I heard of was all these terrible Buffalo winters and, and blizzards and snow. Well, I've told everybody that I've, I've come in contact, you haven't seen snow, you haven't seen coal, you haven't seen blizzards like you do in my hometown, in that area of upstate New York. So uh, as I grew up, it was standard operating procedure. It was something I wouldn't even think to mention in a lecture like this, except this lecture is about this. In your car, no matter what car you had, no matter how many cars you had, you carried a shovel and a bag of sand, and you probably carried a blanket. And that's nothing if not disaster preparedness. You're prepared for the disaster of being stuck or trapped in your car. Now, in Augsburg, it happened regularly, um, still probably does to some extent, but you look and say, okay, well, it can't happen here. It does happen here. In the very latest uh, terrible blizzard we had, I, I believe in 2019, uh, we had two people die stranded in, in trapped cars. So what would you do if you were trapped in your car during a blizzard right now? Not after hearing from me and not after thinking about this, but right now, if it was winter and you were trapped in your car, you have access to water, you have a little food, you have a power uh, bar in the back, you have a blanket, you have a shovel to help you drive, uh, uh, pull out, you have power for a cell phone. All of these things are something that people can think about to prepare for the possibility that they'll be involved in a disaster. Many people carry uh, in their glove compartment or their consoles, I say many, probably not enough, those emergency knives that have the sharp uh, point at the end of them that helps you break the window. And anyone of any medium amount of strength using that knife, which has been specially designed, can smash uh, against the window and have the window break. Because there's always a possibility that in, in a car accident or going off the road or any in a num number of things that could happen, you'd be trapped in your car. Uh, the same thing, what would you do in your home if there was a fire? Have any of you talked to your kids about that? Uh, when my kids were young, uh, we talked to them uh, multiple times, two or three times a year, and we even practiced a few fire drills while they were very young until they got old enough to, to have remembered uh, what to do. Um, but uh, not only a fire, how about a tornado, a landslide, an earthquake? All possible, we've had tornadoes here in Western New York. Uh, what if it destroyed your home? Are you prepared to find someplace else to live? Do you have access to your money? Your, can you? Can you handle your financial needs? Um, in a disaster like that, uh, a big question I ask people is what memories would you lose? Um, it, it's probably impossible to back up every photograph and movie and, and video and, and uh, you know, thing that you have like that and, and memorabilia and clothing and baptism gowns, but um, uh, maybe you should be thinking about putting some of them away. And this, this is all tied to just a generic kind of disaster planning for a, a personal level. Uh, COVID-19, um, a major disaster, a worldwide disaster um, faced on many levels of, of government. Uh, when I was a kid, I read War of the, World, War of the Worlds, um, watched the movies. Um, it was based on the idea of, of a virus uh, attacking uh, from outer space. The Andromeda strain, uh, again, a, a virus that can be, uh, can't be controlled. I read all these things. And then and they were science fiction. They were science fiction as little as nine months ago. If we'd have talked about the story of COVID prior to December of 2019, you would have said, no, impossible. Yep, you're gonna be walking around with masks, you're gonna be social distancing, businesses are gonna be closed. Nobody would have believed it because it just doesn't seem possible. So look how it started. Unspecified reports in 2019, December, about this virus. And, and think back, if, if you don't remember, or you don't remember the steps that this took, this is exactly how it unfolded. Well, those were nebulous. Ah, oh, you know, this strange virus. Oh, something happened in China. Well, this is really weird, you know. And then if, if you were following it a little bit, there was a story about the two Chinese scientists who had started to tweet and send messages out to the rest of the world saying, hey, 
we have a problem that's going to spread. The Chinese government silenced them. So the reports that, that still continue to come out uh, from China were innocuous, but they were becoming more desperate. This is the stuff of, of a science fiction novel. Cruise ships were entering the ports of the United States, and they were being quarantined. Passengers were being held, held for weeks. Um, as this was happening, the virus was being spread uh, undocumented through Thailand, Japan, Korea, unknowingly. And we know now it was coming in from Europe. And even though we stopped, we banned international travel from the Far East and um, uh, areas like that, it was still coming in through Europe. That's how it spread initially into New York State. And finally, three to four months after December, the World Health Organization says, yep, this is real. This is, this is a virus. Um, I don't think I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure what this next slide goes, but I don't think I have to tell you before I switch, we weren't prepared. And, and we, uh, I'm talking about the world. No one in the world was prepared to deal with this. Um, virus snowballed, state shut down, uh, and there, there is what I was referring to, my fourth bullet point. Society, the, the world as a whole, was not prepared. Uh, as a result, businesses uh, have gone out of business. Um, I like to go back to this uh, because I remember this acutely, and I'm sure some of you do. Anybody run out of toilet paper? Uh, did anybody go to the store and find it hard to, to get toilet paper? And not only toilet paper, but uh, paper products in general. Um, you may forget that uh, foodstuffs were becoming hard to get. Pasta aisles were cleared out in most of the grocery stores I went to. Um, some medicines, uh, some of the, the more um, specific um, medicines, were becoming hard to get. And when I say the medicines and I refer to the meats, they were going to get harder to get. If we hadn't flattened the curve when we did, done when I say we, you know, society and, and countries as a whole, and this had gotten worse, these shortages would have occurred. We were on the brink. We're on the brink of most meatpacking um, facilities closing down because of the effect of the virus on them. And that would have prevented our access to meats. Um, a lot of my Homeland Security friends, uh, when we, we would talk about these type of things when I was still working, and of course I'm still in touch with them and I, and I talk to them a great deal now, um, we talk about the disaster that would happen if the grocery food chain was broken. Um, you don't realize that most grocery stores restock uh, about 100% or, or nearly 100% of at least perishable and, and repeated items every three or four hours, a large grocery chain. And that stuff has to be on site and it has to be brought there on site by trucks. Um, uh, if this was ever to be interrupted, um, this would be, uh, you're seeing riots in the street now for Black Lives Matter. I don't want to um, inflame or make more of the situation as possible, but if grocery stores started to shut down, or have rationed hours, uh, you would see the same type of things. I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid that's what you'd see. So uh, COVID-19, uh, just an example, but one that's living with us, one that's here right away. Anybody remember the October surprise? November, 2006, I was driving home having taught a class at uh, Hilbert. And uh, I live in Lockport, it took me three hours to get home. Trees down everywhere, cars off the road uh, all over. If you remember, uh, after the storm was over, we looked back at the, the statistics, 26 people killed um, during the storm. Thruway was closed for days. There were neighborhoods, um, some uh, nursing homes, some hospitals without power for, for days and uh, in some areas, two weeks. Roads blocked uh, first by snow and then by fallen trees. Um, Interesting point with the October surprise, a lot of schools shut down and it was a difficult period. Uh, there was no instruction done at home that I know of at that point. Um, and mostly when the school shut down, the students just had to miss the, the classes and, and the information and make it up when they come back. But it's always the case of a Monday morning quarterbacking, but we should have learned from that. We should have learned that here's, a, here's an issue where we had a two week problem. What if this had gone longer? And of course, now we see it has, and it's become a huge problem. Um, and of course, for November, uh, or for Buffalo, it's November in 2014. We had the blizzard of 2019 where the throughway was closed down. We had huge problems with the throughway being uh, closed down. And that's when we had two people uh, die in their cars. 
So, you know, remember disaster, it, it can't happen here. Well, it can. Um, the important thing about responding to a disaster is having a plan. You need to make a plan of, of how you're going to respond, how you're going to deal with the issue as it occurs, how you're going to mitigate any damage that happens, and then how you'll roll back into business once it starts. And again, this is a complicated subject. I'm going to hit some high points pertaining to small businesses uh, and families um, and just talk about what we can do. Um, there are four steps to disaster preparedness. This, depending what disaster preparedness class you take. These are sometimes jumbled a little bit or they're, they're called a little bit different. Uh, but the way we're going to address them tonight is your risk assessment um, and then mitigation, identifying the key elements uh, of the uh, disaster response, what could happen, what you need to respond to, and then we're going to talk about the implementation of, of the plan. So risk assessment. Remember, I had an entire doctoral class on risk assessment. You're getting four bullets. It's, it's all I can do in, in an hour. Um, but you can see the definition here. Risk management is the process of identifying, analyzing, assessing, and communicating risk, and accepting, avoiding, transferring, or controlling it to an acceptable level, considering the associated costs and benefits of any action taken. You know where you've done risk assessment, every single one of you? Insuring your vehicles. When you decided what level of insurance to buy with your car, you have identified the risk and said, these are the chances I'm gonna incur personal injury. These are the chances I'm gonna cause personal injury. These are the chances I'm gonna uh, cause property damage. These are uh, the chances I'm gonna incur collision damage. And you've insured yourself for that much. You decided that you were comfortable with a certain amount of risk and paying a certain amount of money to deal with that risk. You assessed and managed your risk. That's what risk assessment is. So if you think about assessing risk in, in an area of uh, disaster preparedness, it's the same thing. And, you know, I liken it a little bit to gambling. How, how brave are you? How much risk are you willing to take? And how much are you willing to chance? Um, so to do a basic risk assessment, uh, I've, I've put four questions up here. Um, these are kind of distilled down from uh, some of the research and teaching I've done. Um, they're also pretty much aligned with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, guidelines. So I'm going to show you some, uh, some uh, links at the end of the PowerPoint from FEMA. You might want to screen capture them or do something to, to keep them. Um, but you can find some good information from FEMA. And uh, if I forget to say it, I'm thinking about it now, uh, New York State has great uh, disaster uh, management resources on their website. So it's just in our place that you can go to look. Um, so your risk assessment, uh, what are the threats and hazards that your organization or your home faces? Um, and I've got three things up here. Fire, every organization, every home faces the possibility of fire. Um, you can maintain minimal fire insurance on your home. And again, that's a, an assessment and a management of risk that you decide to take, or you can have a huge, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, investment in insuring yourself against fire. But you then have to consider, well, what are the percentages I'm gonna have a fire? They're not high, they're, they're really not. So it's something interesting. Um, a flood, there's no way, no how, any possibility where I live, I'm gonna have a flood. There just isn't. But there are many places, I think as many of you probably know, in Western New York where it's a, it's a very likely possibility. You're spending more for flood insurance than I am, and we both assessed that risk and, and decided how we're going to go into it. Um, I put guns here because I was, I was thinking one night, um, uh, some people have guns in their homes. Uh, I was a law enforcement officer for 30 years. I have guns in my home. Having guns in your home is a risk. It's a safety risk. It's a risk to um, you know uh, uh, the incidents that can happen if you're ever broken into and those guns are stolen. You need to determine uh, again simply, and I'm I'm using this only as an example of what risk management is. Somebody like me that had to have guns in the home, I had to determine to what extent, how would I store them, where would I store them, how many, what was the access, and what do I do as a plan, and what do do I do with my kids. 
My kids have been taught from a very young point with uh, squirt guns. They never, ever, ever touch a gun. They always come and get an adult. They never do anything other, other than that. Um, and uh, um, again, I use it uh, not as a Second Amendment issue or whatever, just as an idea of the type of risk that you, you might not think of when you're assessing the risk for either your, your small business or, or your home. Um, the next question you want to ask are, what are the characteristics of the threats and the hazards? Um, how many threats and hazards affect your organization or home? I worry about fire. I don't worry about floods. It's, it's a good example. I worry about guns. Some of you out there may have a gun in the house, and it may be a risk you haven't thought of. Um, so again, you need to, to come up with a list of characteristics of the threats and hazards you, you may face. Then you have to judge the likelihood of the occurrence. This is where you're starting to throw the dice. This is where you can look up some statistics online. You can, you can find some information. Uh, you can talk to your insurance guy uh, or gal. Uh, they can help you. Um, and then you have to decide what the overall risk value is. You have to decide how much you're gonna pay for that auto insurance that's gonna cover how much of a percentage of things that can happen. This is risk assessment in four bullets. Uh, what is mitigation? Uh, real quick. Oh, um, sorry. I just wanted to, to highlight the idea of identifying these points of access, how access is given. When in the example of the gun, it's very concrete, you know, how many are in the home, how are they secured, um, what is the method by which access is given. But I think that can also be applied for things like floods. So if you live on the top of a hill, where are the access points for water? basically just from the sky or from a pipe breaking. Right. Um, but if you were living in a different environment, maybe you're in the bottom of two hills converging, or maybe you're by a stormwater drain, it's still thinking about those points of access of where can the threats come from. And it's, it's also like insulating your home, you know, where can the cold right. air come from? And thinking about access, um, that just seemed really important to me. So I thought I would stop and, yeah. and say that out loud. Well, that's a good point. I, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, it's all part of creating that, that emergency management plan. And when you sit back, um, uh, my wife and I can't sit back and think of all these things. You need input from other places. You need to watch a presentation like this. Talk to someone uh, who might be involved in the, in the same type of business. Um, so that, that's a great point. Um, so uh, the next step in the uh, process of disaster preparedness and disaster response is the mitigation process. Um, uh, you may, and, and, and people, you know, I, I hate to say it, but chances are uh, some of us are going to be involved in disaster of some uh, type at some time. Um, mitigation is the strategy of preparing for incurring for living in that disaster and then lessening the effects that uh, occur by the business or, or homeowner. So for example, uh, these really are kind of um, skewed towards the, the business, um, um, uh, small businesses, but um, you might want to implement structural changes. Uh, if you're worried about flooding, elevate your facilities, flood proofing. Um, we talk about the example of New Orleans in one of our Homeland Security disaster management classes and I keep asking the class, why do we keep fixing New Orleans? 90% of New Orleans, and these, you can look these up. I've, I've already looked at the, the, the statistics up for this class. 90% of New Orleans, greater New Orleans, is built under sea level. I can't understand that. And, and when there's finally a flood and when things are destroyed, I can't understand why they don't move to a place that's above sea level. But, um, you know, I'm not saying people should move out of their homes or away from their neighborhoods, but it's something that, that I think, you, you know, should be considered. Um, so uh, elevating facilities, flood proofing, uh, implementing earthquake retrofitting measures uh, done in a lot of places like uh, countries like Japan. Let me see I if I can know. Also with the um, floodplain level, thinking about the Netherlands where the entire country right. is under sea level. And so when you are thinking about plans, going to someone who has had the experience previously right. and tapping on them, see what they know, um, yep. get those two countries together. Uh, if anybody 
lines. I'm just going to step away. I'm going to close the curtain that's causing this light uh, to sure. shine on me. Uh, I'm still here. I'll keep talking. I'm not going anywhere. But I hope this will make your picture a little bit better. I hope that was better. We took a little break. Yeah, yeah, that, that looks time. great. You look a little right. bit less motley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Difficult, uh, but yes. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, businesses should also think about hardening their infrastructure, um, security measures for facilities, uh, locks on the doors. We talked about access. How about physical access to, to um, buildings and organizations? Systems, uh, computer systems, um, uh, the uh, machinery systems that are in place. Um, you may want to uh, reroute utilities. Again, it depends all on the type of risk you've uh, identified or are, are foreseeing that are possibly uh, going to happen um, to, your, to your business. Um, and another consideration is a geographical dispersion of the organization's normal daily operations. If an earthquake uh, hits in Milwaukee, and destroys 90% of the businesses downtown, and your only business location is Milwaukee, you're pretty much out of business, you're probably not gonna come back. However, if you had a satellite office in two other places, it, it could be simply the reason for having that satellite uh, uh, office is that this could help you mitigate, get through the disaster, and restart your normal operations. Um, when, I, when I, I, I keep saying it can't happen here, it can't happen here, I went into a business that I've been um, going to for 29 years here in Western New York. I'm not going to give their name uh, because they've kept this private as far as I know. Um, done business. I, I was uh, checking out with someone that I knew that I'd, I'd seen many, many times before. And she said, okay. And she started to ask for my name and my phone number and my address. I said, all that's in the computer. And, and she looked at me and she says, no, it's not. I said, what do you mean it's not? She says, well. The computers crashed last night. I said, the computers crashed? Yeah, she says, we're starting from zero. I said, well, what about a backup? And she said, well, we lost our backup too. Well, that tells me that what happened was they probably were the victims of a ransomware attack, just like ECMC was. Now there's been a number of those that have occurred in the time since ECMC. A couple of them made the paper, a couple of them haven't. But a ransomware attack, if you don't know, is where a hacker takes over your computer system and literally locks you out of it. And you cannot get back into it. So even if you have a backup, you can't run the backup and restore it because you, you've lost access to your equipment. Um, so what that tells me is, is they had that kind of attack. Now they're a small business. They're only one, one location here in Western New York. Um, and they were having uh, some real difficulty, but they were mitigating their way through it, but they were kind of building their system from the ground up all over again. Uh, probably not the most efficient way to go, but it shows it can happen anywhere. Um, one thing to consider about COVID-19, and, and I consider the government's response uh, and educational institutions' responses to have been pretty poor around here, but uh, a mitigation tactic is telecommuting. That's one way businesses have been able and, and in schools to stay in business is to set up these um, uh, Zoom type of, of communities and work um, and kept them going. Um, prior to the virus, and we should have seen this back in 2006 when we had schools out for a couple of weeks, most schools and many colleges weren't prepared to, to do this. And, uh, and my point here is they're really, they're still not. Um, Identify your key elements. Uh, once the mitigating effects of an incident uh, have been identified, you know what you want to do to get yourself uh, out of trouble. You need to, to know the uh, critical players in the situation. Um, you need to decide in your small organization or if you're the homeowner, uh, all your family, what people and what staff need to know what their roles are and what you expect of them. Um, you need to keep these people informed. You need to provide them with that paper plan, but then you need to practice. It needs to be practiced and practiced and practiced for proper implementation. Um, a couple of things for small business in any kind of uh, plan for disaster preparedness. You want to identify the succession and chain of command, and you want to uh, identify the delegation of authority. Uh, there are many times uh, you need an immediate response if the CEO isn't available or the uh, HR manager isn't available. Somebody needs to make a decision 
And I have seen too many examples of organizations, even within the government, when the one person that is allowed to make a mistake is not there. Um, people um, are, are mill around in um, uh, just uh, uh, confusion because they don't know what to do. Um, you need to provide the requisite technology. My son worked for an organization where everyone had laptops, everyone had remote phones, and as soon as they were told by the state they had to shut down, they just rolled right in the next day to doing business and everyone working from home. They were prepared. Uh, essential records, I just told you about my uh, organization that didn't have a, a backup uh, to their computer records, had to start from the ground. You need to know where your essential records are. For homeowners, this is where I say, where are all your keepsakes? Where are all your memories? Where are all the things? You can't hide them all. You can't store them all. But you, I don't think you want them all located centrally in your house because if a disaster happens, you're going to lose them. Uh, and you want to decide how you're going to communicate. For a business, uh, if your business is taking phone orders and the phones go down or the internet goes down, you're going to be um, uh, a heck out of luck here. If you haven't made alternate plans for communication. Um, implementation of a continuity plan uh, uh, involves actually getting it out there and practicing it. Now, there's four phases, readiness and preparedness, knowing what to do, knowing how you're going to respond. There's activation, knowing how you're going to activate it, what you're going to do to announce to everybody that you're in the midst of some sort of mitigation or recovery plan. There's the actual operation. And then once you've started to operate, once you've started to climb out of that hole that that disaster uh, has brought you into, there's reconstitution, uh, how you're going to get yourself back to where you were before the disaster occurred. What should we be doing? Individuals, COVID-19. Um, uh, generically, remember the steps you want to follow are assess your risk, design a plan to mitigate it, identify the key elements, and implement the plan. So what does that mean for COVID-19? Um, remember what I've said. I've said this the whole presentation. Prepare the worst case scenario. So right now, as we sit here, as I speak to you, as my college is getting ready to go back, as you folks are getting ready to go back, as schools are getting ready to go back, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is in our total shutdown. And I'm not convinced as a, as a disaster manager and someone familiar with this type of, of thing, I'm not convinced that we're not going to see this again. I am afraid that we're going to go back to a, to a shutdown. So what did we see last time when you're assessing your risk and deciding what you need to do? Shortage, paper products, toilet papers, shortages now of cleaning supplies, even though we've uh, recovered. Some medicines, vegetables, pastas, meats. Um, there was an article in the paper today how the building um, uh, trades are getting wiped out by the huge increase in the cost of lumber. Well, there's not only been a, an increase in the cost of lumber, but there's a scarcity of lumber. These things are going to continue. Schools are going to close down again. Businesses are going to close. Unemployment is going to occur. So do you have a plan for your children being schooled at home? Many people going into this fall still don't have a plan. Um, have you stocked up on essentials? And it, just a little laugh there. It doesn't mean liquor and guns. Although I will tell you, I, I personally know that there was just an unbelievably huge run on firearms and ammunition uh, after the close of the uh, quarantine and shutdown. I don't know why. The same thing occurred immediately following 9-11. I didn't understand that either. Um, no one needs uh, liquor and guns to get through a, a virus, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is what it is. But here are the things that, that you do need to, to fill up on. I tell people right now, stock up on paper supplies. They're there, but they could go short again. Cleaning supplies, uh, hand wipes, lotion, bleaches, medicines. If you've got, uh, you know, aspirins and some of your um, uh, prescription medicines, I always try to stay a month ahead. You might want to stay even a little farther ahead. And if you have a specialized medicine, check with your medical professional or, or whatever to uh, uh, ensure that you're going to have access to that medicine. Importantly, uh, people tend to just wait and see how this is going to work out. Do you have a financial plan in place? What if one of you is laid off? What if one of you has to stay home with the kids? Um, this is uh, the last quarantine went for about two months um, and we're still dribble drabbling uh, out of it. If we go back into it, it's going to be at least another month. Are you prepared to handle that? Um, so consider this, if you take away nothing else from, the, from my lecture, sorry, it's my style, but my lecture tonight, 
Uh, the proper response to any emergency or disaster is proper, proper prior planning. Um, proper prior, prior planning does not include hoarding and panic buying and liquor and, and guns, but it does include the four steps I've talked about tonight, making a plan, thinking responsibly, and practicing that plan. So if you have to implement it, you, your family members, the people of your small business are, are ready to go. Um, I kind of pushed that uh, to get through 45 minutes, Gabrielle. That's what I have. Uh, I have one screen left that I'll put up, which is uh, three uh, nice sites from FEMA. If folks know how to screen grab, they can screen grab that. Um, I'll send those out. Um, I said this in the chat, but we'll send those out in an oh. email follow up as well. Great. Uh, Great. So folks will have that. So, so please, somebody have a question. I just talked for 45 minutes. Somebody right. else. We'll give somebody them a break. Yeah. Any uh, hand waves or if you want to um, put it in the chat function, you can do that. I don't see anyone's hands up. So I prompted her and I'm going to ask Amy to unmute and to give us a comment. Uh, Erica oh. says that was fascinating. Thank you, Stephen and BMS. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, were you looking for me, Gabrielle? Yes, Amy, I was wondering, um, because uh, no one else had spoken up first, I just randomly called on you um, to, to give a comment or a question. Oh my gosh, I was actually trying to generate one while, while that was being asked. Um, I mean, I guess if there's, if there's one thing, like in the midst of COVID right now, I mean, you kind of already went through and like stocking up on certain things. Is there something else that you could say with the, the potential of a shutdown coming up that we should be doing in preparation, um, you know, or any, any other big points that you could suggest of what we could do either as individuals, as businesses um, to prepare? Well, I think I've covered most of them um, and schooling is, is the big one. Uh, a couple of other things I, I could add is uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, you may want to go out and get some masks. Um, I don't see this medically getting worse, but it can't hurt to have gowns or, or rubber gloves in the house, I would think. Uh, and, and then financial considerations. I don't know if, if many of you know of it, but uh, the U.S. Mint was experiencing a coin shortage uh, during the uh, height of the quarantine, and they were actually putting out calls to banks for uh, coins because there weren't enough coins in circulation. So for a disaster like this, there is always the question, especially, uh, it's not quite COVID related, but if the, uh, we've always talked in Homeland Security and with the Secret Service about how the banking industry was hacked in general or the internet was hacked to a point where uh, ATMs uh, became uh, dangerous or unavailable for use. Uh, it would be a question of how to get money. Um, you might want to have a little cash you know, stored away at home uh, for those emergency purposes. And again, um, you know, this isn't a hundred dollars. This is more like a thousand dollars. Um, you know, um, you're, you're going to store away food and, and paper towels. It's not three rolls. It's probably 10. So uh, you need to think about the worst case disaster uh, and go from there. That's great. That uh, leads into, I've got one question and then uh, Casey's got a question too. So uh, the first question is, is there a standard or a best practice regarding a percentage of income that a business should plan to invest as its preparedness training, as a benchmark or as a guideline? You know, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there's one benchmark, but I think you will find different places like FEMA, uh, Small Business Association uh, of America, um, organizations like that will have a standard that you can look at. Um, so I, I think just a little Google searching will, will help you find that. Um, my guess is if you, if you Google that exact question, you would come up with it. But yes, I've seen in all the courses I've taken, I've seen a number of benchmarks um, and it's an excellent question. I, I will tell you this, it's gonna be more than you think. Uh, and, and when you look at it, you go, oh, I can't do that. So now you're risk assessing, you can't do that. How much can you do? How much can you put aside and not cripple yourself to the extent that you think putting that, that full amount is 
um, risk assessment is a is a gamble. It's like playing cards. Yeah. And we've got a good number of questions coming through now. So uh, from Casey, Dr. Steven, do you have any tips for thinking outside of the box for worst case scenario? Like the point that you had just made about coins, couldn't things always get worse? And yep. actually, uh, if you don't mind, I, I think that one of the good ways of, of thinking about this is to talk to different people about what they think the worst case could be, because different perspectives will definitely give you right. things that you hadn't considered. And yep. I'll pass it back to you. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a point that I make uh, to some folks when they're writing a thesis is that they get so involved in the thesis, they need some outside input. They need this thinking outside the box, because you can't do it yourself. And Gabrielle, you're absolutely right. I, I think I, I mentioned it in, the, in, the, in my lecture about a husband and wife trying to determine what sort of risks they face. You only have your blinders uh, on, and it's good to get a perspective from somewhere else. So for thinking outside the box, go ask people that, that maybe aren't in your situation and they're different social group or a different, they, they're uh, different. What I've always found is uh, I always uh, commiserated and hung out with law enforcement people. Well, we have a certain way of thinking that's, that's you know, not very, um, uh, that hugely diverse. And I, I just mean in, in, you know, think in one certain way. So I would go to my brother who worked at a factory and I would go to my best friend who worked at an accountant's. And I would ask them the same question that I had that I was, that I was wondering about. So uh, yeah, a perfect example, and that would have been my answer about outside the box, yeah. Go to outside sources that you don't really associate yourself with every day. Good, and then we've got a question from Barbara. Um, I work for a small government office. Our doors are open to the public. Is there a resource you would recommend for information to prepare our office should an irate resident come yeah. through the doors? Absolutely. If, if you work for a government agency, uh, this should be easy. If it's a New York State government agency, uh, there are New York State resources for it. Um, and I would just begin by, by Googling, Google Active Shooter um, uh, for your office uh, on the New York State website. And again, prepare for the worst case scenario. Uh, you've asked the question in, in a way that leads me to believe, well, somebody might come in because their bill was too high and they might yell and shout about it. That's not the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is an active shooter. If you're prepared for the worst case scenario, you're going to be easy, easily able to handle the, the lighter case. Um, and I can tell you right now that uh, go to DHS's website and in one click, you should be able to get to their active shooter um, uh, section with an entire lecture and lesson and list of resources for preparing and, and dealing with an active shooter. I will say one other thing. You should ask a supervisor or someone you trust at work if there's a, a plan that's existing in place. I would be surprised if there wasn't, but if there wasn't, it's something that they, they really should get to. I, I can't stress enough uh, in my business and my experience, uh, this is just like a fire drill. Um, uh, people have fire drills, they've always had them, they take them for granted. Active shooter, they go, oh, this is terrible. It's something, you know, we don't really want to talk about it. You have to, you have to, and, and you have to come up with a way to deal with it. Good question. We've got a, a bunch of thank yous in the chat. Oh, um, thank you, everybody. I, didn't, I can't see the chat. For everything else I can see, I can't see that. Yeah, if you wanted to close out your um, presentation, you might be able oh. to check out yeah. all the nice things that the yeah, little I, folks are saying about I, you. I thought I would leave that up for you, but that's fine. And we are, yeah, I knew I, I pressed you a little bit to, to cut it down um, and make sure that we did have time for Q&A. Uh, yeah. But it, it always depends on, on the audience, what the audience wants as well. But this has been very informative, this um, getting us to think about the things that we don't generally consider in our everyday life. Well, some people do. I do have a, a friend of the family that is a disaster prepper that um, immediately when news hit, when the word pandemic came out, she started calling everyone and saying, I've got my N95 masks and I've got extras and are you loaded with your food and your water and do you have your medicine? So she, she called the phone tree and made sure that all of us had our plans in place too. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, she she honestly is someone that comes from law enforcement as well. So yeah. she has got this on the mind. So I have another interesting anecdote. Uh, I was a firearms instructor for years. My partner uh, in, in investigations was also a firearms instructor. And, and we would go to lunch and we'd go to Moe's. We would sit down at Moe's and we'd put our lunch on the table and we'd just look at each other. And for the first 30 seconds, we'd go, where would the bad guy come in? Come in that door. What are we going to do? Well, we'll turn this way and we'll do And something we did is just a matter of habit. Well, I'm exactly the way your friend was. And I reacted the same way because of that law enforcement background. When this pandemic first started to associate itself, I went on to Amazon. I bought personal protective equipment. I bought some N95 masks. I didn't think up about stocking up on toilet paper. I missed that one. Um, but I advised people before this happened that they should do it. And that attitude was out there and people don't remember. Now they know. They're out Well, we experienced it. This is the way we felt. But you don't remember because everybody said to me, you don't need to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy any of those. And when they did and they were out of stock or they were a hundred dollars a mask, it was too late. Right. Uh, so I guess this brings us to the end of our program. We really thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McMartin, as well as to each of our participants. Um, it's lovely to see your names, if not your faces. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about viruses and vaccines. If you would like to sign up for that, I'm going to drop another registration link in the chat. Um, I'm not super speedy on that. Uh, and we will be sending out a survey in the morning and we'll include those links as well. So the survey tomorrow um, is just to get some feedback. As I said, this was our first of the virtual conversations in science. So if you would give us your thoughts, that would be wonderful. Um, and then uh, if you'd like to visit us in person, we are open on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays and our special exhibit, Golden Mummies of Egypt, is extended through October 18th. So, thank you, everybody. It was my pleasure. I enjoy these things. So, thank you so thank much. You. Gabrielle. We appreciate you. Okay. Night. Good night. <laughs>